welcome to this uh, pemsa lecture series that is organized by the pemsa uh, and uh, this idea of this uh, lecture series was in fact uh, brought about by prof kudagamman and we should be thankful to professor kudagamman for organizing this lecture series so today's speaker is uh, dr jeevanth ratnayaka uh, you may know him very well he is one of is uh, a proud alumnus of peradeni medical faculty and he is a senior lecturer at the department of surgery at peradeni medical faculty and he is also uh, working as a consultant surgeon at teaching hospital peradeni uh, so today dr jeevanth will be uh, discussing about the management of trauma uh, so without taking much time i'll hand over to dr jeevanth uh, to continue over with his lecture what do you say thank you very much kaushika <coughs> thank you very much for kindly for this uh, interruption i hope you can see we uh, are see me now uh, we we'll wait for the power I, i think i have backup power I, uh, as long as power last we can go um uh, right so uh, you thank you very much uh, for pemsa uh, inviting me to talk to you all i hope uh, almost all the uh, the audience is uh, actually finally students and i think there are uh, fourth year students as well so i uh, actually these lectures are already been done but i would like to uh, this kind of a revision so i would like to go through uh, 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 the trauma management principle again right uh, within next one and a half hours or so uh, if you have any question you can uh, um, ask uh, at any time okay so i was initially asked to do uh trauma management and abdominal trauma but i thought uh, i mean there is nothing much for you for undergraduate level to discuss in that uh, topic so instead i will discuss uh, uh, trauma management in general um right we are actually in the middle of pandemic uh, uh, so each day we lose about how many today i think uh, about 8000 people a day like but if that is Uh, in media but actually if you really look at the trauma deaths it is more than that for each, every day we fa- are facing a trauma death worldwide it is a pandemic uh, uh, sorry going so each day about 10 10000 people die in the world if you really look at uh, uh, and the the amount of people who sustain um, life long injuries also like that so um, it is very important for us to understand uh, and uh, discuss basic principles of trauma management so i think you are familiar with this graph this is uh, this is what you call trimodal death distribution if you plot the number of death uh, against the time Uh, since the event if you will get a uh, graph like this uh, you can see there are three peaks uh, first second and third peak the first peak is just after at the time of the impact for example if a bomb blast uh, you start certain number of people will die on the spot so those are unpreventable deaths so you can't do much about those deaths once it happens so these are uh, uh these are unpreventable death first peak uh so what you can do about those deaths of course uh, of course uh, what you call primary prevention it is just uh trauma prevention so that is of course um law enforcement and things like that uh, and education health education but what we are really interested here in today is of course second peak uh, that is after few minutes or 30 minutes or so or, uh, and couple of hours so we call those pe- that period golden hours following trauma so during that period a certain number of pe- people will die and uh, those people if you treat them ac- ac- correctly uh, uh, we 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 can save some of these people so that is the important uh, point here so how to uh, manage those people who are are going to die uh, within uh, f- within few hours after the injury and uh, so uh, 
And if you look at the cause of death uh, regard, during these peaks, the first peak, of course, there are uh, very severe injuries like uh, severe head injuries, decapitation, transection of body or fragmentation, that kind of injuries. You can't do anything about those things. But second peak, why they die, if you, if you reanalyze, the commonest, one of the commonest causes is hemorrhage, bleeding. So bleeding can be prevented if you if you treat them accordingly, or, or that can be airway obstruction, things like that. Second peak is due to those injuries, which if you can treat them in time, you can save them. So that is the important. And third peak, you can see later on, uh, that is because of other problems like uh, infection, sepsis, uh, and even organ failure, or DVT, things like that. So that's uh, another aspect. We are not going to discuss those uh, as uh, that's a third peak today. What we are really interested in is this second peak, or that you, in other words, what you call golden hours uh, following trauma. Uh, so when you are treating this uh, trauma patient, multi trauma patient, there are, there are phases we can classify uh, is. Uh, we can stage or can, there are various steps when you're managing patient with multiple trauma. Uh, uh, so if you if, if, I, if I can list them, preparation, uh, which include hospital pre hospital preparation, so we'll discuss it a little bit more and triaging these people, we'll discuss it again. And then the important is when the patient received in the hospital, uh, what you but the first thing you, you call initial management of the patient that is in, that include what you call the primary the primary survey which you all know that will follow the A B C D E order so so there are various uh, protocols so uh, one of the important thing is what it is A T L S protocol advanced trauma life support protocol which we used to follow so that is how it be done and resuscitation that is. Actually, primary survey and uh, recitation go, uh, I mean, in parallel. So, so these two steps go in parallel, and then you will get there are a few things as you assess primarily and resuscitate the patient, and there are a few things investigation you need to do. So that it, those are called adjuncts to your primary survey. We'll discuss them in detail later, and then. <coughs> At the end of the primary survey and resuscitation, then you have to make a decision, a very important decision, uh, what to do regarding your patient from their own word, whether you can treat this patient in your hospital or in your capacity, or whether you can't treat, if you can't treat, if you can't treat the injuries uh, from their own word, then you have to make a decision whether patient, you need to transfer this patient to a bigger hospital. Sorry. Uh, so that decision has to be taken soon after stabilizing the patient. So that is, we have to decide. And then if you are not going to transfer, transfer patient to another big hospital, then you have time to do what is called secondary survey, which is very detailed examination and assessment, um, uh, assessment uh, uh, which include full examination plus history taking plus the relevant investigation. So, and then after that, depending on the injuries, you need to offer them the definitive care. So, which includes various um, sub specialties, and that will include rehabilitation as well. And all important thing, another next important thing is to document and or any medical legal issues. So, that those are the main phases of managing a trauma, pa a multi trauma patient. So pre-hospital, if I were to give you a few words, so pre-hospital preparation, of course, <coughs> you need to have good uh, parameter staff. Now in our country, a uh, few years ago, there were nothing basically. We had no pre-hospital preparation, only the people themselves uh, bring the patient, whatever the vehicle they have. But now we have this, uh, this uh, ambulance service, still not widespread, but still for the beginning, that is a good thing. And uh, only thing we don't have very well-trained paramedical staff. Sorry. Uh, 
but uh, in time to time come being, things will develop but important thing is whenever when you are trans when in, on the field when you are transporting a patient to hospital it's very important to inform the receiving hospital so that they can be prepared so otherwise there are there can be delays so communication between hospital and pre hospital staff is very important when the receiving doctors can prepare and they can understand they can prepare for the problem uh, they are going to face and when it's very important is how to prepare the hospital for this so in the hospital there should be a designated area to receive these people for like emergency department resuscitation rooms they need to we need to prepare this place uh, and then uh, then there should be team there's called trauma team so trauma team there are people so there should be team leader who is usually very experienced clinician maybe anesthetist or even surgeon and there should be anesthetist or somebody who can who who is familiar of managing especially airway issues and and resuscitation so anesthetist is the best or emergency medicine doctors they are the they are the people who can attend to these people patient uh, um, in that situation and the surgeon and nursing staff and supporting staff this team should be there uh, in at any time to receive if you are if you are going to receive uh, uh, emergency trauma patient to your hospital and then of course you have your imaging facilities and laboratories and blood bank available if you need blood and all the medication to treat emergencies like oxygen fluids blood and blood products and all the emergency uh, medication including adrenaline things like that and the equipment to ma maintain airway intubation cannula splints and cervical collars spinal boards uh, monitors etc etc so you so, so the person who is uh, in charge of this particular area or emergency department look into this thing and they should and there should be uh, uh, these things should be ready so in some hospital there are what you call emergency trolleys so, or emergency cupboards now uh, these things should be available and important next important thing is your own protection the personal protection now of course we are talking uh, a lot about this personal protection equipment uh, regarding covid but when it comes to trauma management what when the covid season is gone what we are uh, what we are really worried about so you need to protect yourself uh, including gloves and mask and especially eye protection to prevent splashes that splashes things like that you need to take uh, care of yourself so those are this is this include the preparation and the triaging is to sort triage is a french word to sort uh, it in it means that uh, uh, can you hear me yes yes sir you can all right good. thank you um, so uh, this, this sorting is the triaging is required if you are dealing with many patients all right but if you are dealing with one patient you don't need to try it but if you are receiving a lot of patients at say at, at a given time uh, then when the resources are low then of course you need to triage otherwise um, you do you will lose patience so triage is sought so this triage is done according to the priority of treatment not the severity of injury or any other thing so those who need early, immediate management management you need to treat immediately so there are those are labeled in red so immediate and so those are for example the those who are having airway problems tension pneumothorax so during those are the one you need to treat immediately so those are immediate and then we have urgent category that is they are not dying immediately but if you don't treat them they can go into trouble right uh, like compound fracture things like that and delayed of course minor cuts and bruises they won't die even if you don't treat them they won't die so those can be attended later and they are the dead or, or unsalvageable people again we don't waste time if you are dealing with a mass casualty if you are try to save unsalvageable person uh, thanks unsalvageable person uh, then you are losing time and uh, resources so you have to make a decision so so important thing is to categorize the patient depending on their um, requirements right 
not necessarily severe to injury so those who need airway protection airway management you need to attend them first okay likewise right so when you do triage then you come to one person one particular casualty then you need to follow the abcd order so a is for airway and in that there are two small c's uh, for one thing is one is for cervical spine and other one is another small c this is of course not commonly uh, practiced but if you see a catastrophic external bleeder you can attend to that at the same time but this is commonly happen in a field or outside not in hospital like in battlefield if you see a, a artery uh, torn and gushing blood you can put some pressure there that's that's what it means right uh, control of catastrophic outside external bleeding right so first thing is airway management while stabilizing the spinal spine so that is first uh, letter o a stand for so <clears throat> how to uh, how to look after the airway while stabilizing cervical spine i think we will demonstrate these things when you come to clinical clinical um, appointments right uh, if you want to transport a patient so in this and these pictures you can see uh, you can see um, these are head blocks and cervical collars philadelphia collars and patient has been stuck to a uh, spinal board so that is how you need to transport this patient and remember that you don't have to diagnose cervical spine or spine injury during your primary survey there is no requirement what you should be doing is to assume each and every patient you are dealing following trauma is having some sort of cervical or spinal fracture so you need to protect the spine not to diagnose fractures you just protect until you exclude them later you don't have to go and rush patient to extra department and get an extra done while patient is struggling to breathe okay so it's very important so you don't have to diagnose cervical spine or any other cervical spine injury during your primary survey right that is you have to remember any question if you want to raise question i can answer so you assume 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 uh, uh, so there are questions uh, um, no no there was a question here uh, during triage uh, you give priority children no there is no such thing like no priority given for anybody so priorities are depend on your a b c d requirements those who need air protection first breathing second circulation third likewise it's depend depend on the a b c d requirement not the age not the gender not the anything right uh, uh then there are some other question right just just a common problems i will discuss this later there are question i will discuss them from them later and uh, so that's how it goes so you need to protect the cervical spine or and so the rather the whole spine during, during your primary survey for that you need to what you call before you putting any any cervical block so collar you can hold the neck with your hands what you call inline immobilization of your neck and then and if you want to remove your hands then you have to put the head blocks or cervical uh, collar and strap and then spinal board so that's how you stabilize if you want to transport the patient right so that's how you do that and airway management then how right how how do you assess the airway so that is the next question so if you somebody hold the neck and you are stabilizing the neck and then how do you know that the airway is patent so what first thing is to talk to the patient you talk to the patient and if the patient is talking that you can say that patient the airway is fairly um that should be okay otherwise you can't talk so and if you if patient is talking that you can breathe right you you know that the airway is patent but if patient is not breathe not talking maybe unconscious then you have to listen and feel and see for the air movement so you keep bring your uh, the ear to to uh, the head of uh, the face of the uh, the close nose of the patient then listen and then feel they are coming and hitting your ear and check the the chest uh, at the same time whether it is moving so that's how you know that patient is breathing or not and sometimes might hear other noises like gurgling or hoarseness or things like that 
So then, you know, when you, so if you if you hear abnormal sound, then you know that there's an obstruction to the airway. So then you have to attend to that. So what are the causes following the trauma? What are the causes you might encounter which cause trouble, trouble in your airway, right? Uh, most important thing is the fractures in this uh, facial uh, area, maxillofacial fractures. Um, and sometimes patients are unconscious, tongue can fall back, foreign bodies, dentures, blood clots, mucus plaque, anything. Foreign bodies, soft tissue, sometimes the injured soft tissue uh, can uh, aspirate, fracture teeth, dentures, uh, and burn. Following burns, you can have um, edema and then you end up with obstruction and neck trauma and laryngeal tracheal injuries, all those things um, can. Uh, a lot of questions coming. Uh, well, there are a question. I think these questions will be answered as you go, right? So if so, this is one example. Now, now can you see that the car, the, the bottom? So you can see that in screen, uh, there is what you call this is called a bull eye fracture, bull's eye fracture. So what this what happened? This whatever the passenger has not he has not been wearing the seat belt so yes when the car stops uh, it's kind of flying and hitting the windshield so you end up with fracture like injury like this whole facial skeleton is gone so this is a very dangerous thing right so if you see bull eye fractures in the windscreen you know that they have the whatever the whoever the the injured person is has sustained a serious um, uh, facial uh, or even neck and facial injuries like this right so the wearing seat belt is very important. So that is the uh, most important when you are driving, right? Uh, if you look uh, now, uh, airbags um, also important. Now, if you look at the newer newer cars, these airbags will not deploy un unless you are wearing the seat belt. Because if you, you know, what they what they have found that if when, if you not wearing seat belt and if the airbag deploy during sudden stop, your injuries are more. Right, that because of that reason, now the now newer cars, unless you uh, fasten the seat belt, the airbag will not deploy. So you are you have no protection at all if you are not wearing seat belt. Uh, so that's very important, right? Um, so so if you sustain uh, that kind of fracture, you might get fractures like this on the, on the left right hand side. So there are some pictures. This facial skeleton can detach from the the base of the skull. So we, you can you classify this injury into what you call leaf or fresh fractures type three, uh, two and one. One is the least um, complex, and as it ascends up, uh, you'll get more and more complex fractures. When it happens, you can see the, in the picture the facial skeleton go backwards and obstruct the pharynx. So, patient will end up with severe airway uh, obstruction. So, these leaf four fractures are very dangerous. Right. Right. Okay. A lot of questions are coming. Uh, so, so you need to see these things, right? Not going this. One. Right. Right. So, what are the manoeuvres um, to keep the RV open? So, these are the manoeuvres you must have learned during your anesthesia appointment. There are three manoeuvres you can do: head tilt, chin lift, and jaw thrust. But when you are dealing with a trauma patient. You are not supposed to do head tilt. So if you do tilt, that you are damaging the cervical spine. So the first move on maneuver you are not going to do in a uh, patient who has sustained injury, right? So chin lift and jaw thrust only. So just this to keep the airway open. So make remember that no jaw thrust, no no uh, head tilt, jaw thrust and chin lift only, right? Okay. And then what else you can do? <laughs> Uh, we have to clear clear the throat if there ain't anything in the throat suck and remove foreign bodies dentures things like that and if a patient is unconscious you can put a, this oropharyngeal airway to buy time right if you can't do this for a conscious patient because they won't tolerate it <coughs> and what is the definitive airway sometimes your patient require what is called definitive airway so or the, the previous one the oropharyngeal airways oral airways those are not definitive things. You can't keep it for long. Uh, so if your patient require definitive airway, then of course you, you need to have a cuff tube in the trachea. In the trachea, so that is what you call definitive airway. So it can be endotracheal 
tube, right? So the commonest way what we do is orotracheal intubation. So that's, that is what we are familiar with. Sometimes you can't get the tube into the trachea because of, there are, because of problems like facial injuries, you can't intubate. Patient and there are difficult ways to intubate. We'll discuss them later. And in that situation, you might have to go for surgical airway. So <coughs> one thing is do a tracheostomy. Of course, you have to make a hole in the trachea. So thyroid isthmus is there. Uh, so make a hole in the trachea and put a tube there. But that so that will will take time. That you can't do a tracheostomy in emergency setup. I mean, you can do, but it will take time. You need to get things ready. Uh, <coughs> So in that situation, you can do what you call trichotomy. So I'll show some pictures of later on. So make you can make a small hole there. Now you, you can feel your the thyroid cartilage, and underneath that, uh, below that you get you get hyoid bone. In between there's a gap. So you can put a big biggest available cannula, and uh, you can give some little bit of oxygen, and that will buy time. So you can't keep a patient on trichotomy for long, function right? Uh, so, so we will we'll discuss them little bit in detail. So, when you need definitive airways, that's the question. So, if you need to protect airway, or if you need to ventilate the patient, they, those are the basic, the common I mean, in a trauma situation, those are the indication to intubate or they have a definitive airway. So, if, for airway protection, and another thing is uh, ventilation. So, airway protection you require when the, the problem in the airway, like in severe maxillofacial injuries. And if patient is um, developing obstruction like laryngeal or tracheal injuries, so there's hematoma or any other injuries which can uh, obstruct the airway, right? If patient has strido, right? So those are the one important for so airway obstruction. And another thing is, if patient is running risk of aspiration, like somebody is unconscious following head injury, was intoxication, whatever, patient is unable to maintain his airway. He can get aspirated if the GC is below eight. Um, that the patient is unconscious, he, he, he the, the cough reflex is suppressed. In that case, you need to intubate and have a definitive AR with a cough. So cough will prevent the aspiration. So that's why you need a definitive AR. So the other indication is ventilation. So if patient is the breathing is not adequate, uh, or patient is having a head injury which requires hypertension ventilation, or patient is having ap apnea or spinal injuries, which uh, will affect his breathing. Then you have to ventilate the patient mechanically. In that case, also you need to uh, have a definitive airway. Yeah, that can commonly it could be endotracheotomy or tracheostomy too. Right. So now this is of course anesthesia. I mean, just I just put there. So how to how to how to kind of uh, uh, in predict the difficult difficult yeah, airway. Um, right. Right, the questions are coming. So there's one one way of doing this. I think you must have learned this in anesthesia lemon assessment. So L E M O N assessment. L is what is called look for characteristics of uh, difficult intubation, like somebody is chubby and uh, loose teeth and a small mouth, like in your scleroderma burns, right? So and huge goiter. So we we by the look of the patient, we know that this is going to be difficult one, right? Uh, so that is just by looking at the patient, you know that it's a difficult one. And there's another thing called E is evaluate. It is three three two rule. I'll show the pictures, right? What is three 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 two rule? Uh, you will learn this in anesthesia better than here. And M is for malampathy. I think you will you have must have learned this thing also. Um, that is if you ask patient, you say ah, and look at the. Uh, what you call uvula, uh, and depending on that, uh, you can give a uh, rating. And uh, the better one would be one, and uh, the four is the worst, right? Obstruction, if there is anything which obstruct like goiter, right? Or, or, or large tongue, things like that. Or neck mobility, of course, here, of course, we can't talk about neck mobility because this is a trauma patient. You are not going to move the neck it anyway. So, so it doesn't come in trauma situations, right? Uh, so. So this is just just to predict a difficult airway, yeah, okay? Right. So this is this three three two rule. So if you can put three fingers into your patient's mouth like that, 
so that's a good thing if you can't put two three fingers now you know that you are going to have difficulties right and if you can't say can put three fingers or more then you are lucky right and second thing three is uh, the 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 gap between chin and the hyoid bone so if you can put three fingers there that's a good length then it is good right another thing is gap between uh, flow of the mouth and the hyoid so that is if you can put two fingers now this t if you if you have that much of gap in those spaces intubation will be a little bit difficult it will be easier and if it is less than these figures uh, then difficult you end up with a difficult intubation okay so in that case you need to have alternative airways ready otherwise you are going to have trouble so one so this side mm. uh, right uh, so what those these are some of the options you can have to just these are to buy time so if you suppose you have tried to intubate and you, you have failed and then you are in trouble so un, until you get some support or until you get a tracheostomy or something you need to have some other form of airway to maintain patient's life so laryngeal mask is one which is easy to insert i think you will learn this uh, when you are doing an anesthesia appointment how to insert them and the gum elastic book i think you must have seen that is if you can't see the uh, the glottis you can put this thing blindly and then on top of that you can guide the endotracheal tube and if you that also failed then if you don't have any other option to go for unless you can go for this what you call cricothyroid puncture you take the biggest cannula you have and you can feel this gap by a little bit um, antiseptic and just put it right and remove the metal uh, stillet or the body of the needle and then you have a small tube connecting to the trachea then you have to what you can do you can get the oxygen tubing and if you have what you call y connector right you don't if you don't have it this okay you connect that oxygen uh, connection to that uh, cannula and you leave about three or three um, seconds and then disconnect right you give flush of gush of um, oxygen and leave another couple of seconds to explain but for, by doing that you can give some oxygen to the patient that by by doing this you can maintain his oxygen requirement for about 10 15 or maybe even 20 minutes or so <coughs> not more not more beyond that because this tube is not big enough to expirate so he will end up with carbon dioxide retention so you can't keep on going with this tiny tiny um, cannula you need to have a definitive airway <coughs> and uh, during whatever the uh, 10 15 minutes uh, you are going to buy with this uh cricothyroid punch right uh, so that's how you uh, these are some of the uh, escape maneuvers you have when you are having difficulty in uh, getting the airway uh, sorted okay so these are of course temporary measures so you need to have a, a cuff tube in the trachea um, uh, that is a definitive airway right right that is about your breathing <laughs> uh, yeah wait that's next thing the letter is b the breathing so how do you assess assessment is important so you can expose the patient uh, the neck and the chest and uh, see uh, the neck and chest and count breathing cycles and depth of breathing and inspect whether there's a issues in the tracheal deviations so that it might indicate the uh, media star shifting it might indicate pneumothorax or hemothorax or even tension pneumothorax uh, abnormal chest bone might indicate refractures and flare segments any other injuries penetrating injuries uh, sucking wounds right so we have to inspect that is usage just accessory muscle which indicate uh, um, difficulty of breathing and then you have to percuss for fluids and yeah in the chest and abnormal dullness uh, indicating fluids or hyperresonant indicating pneumothorax and listen for the equal bed sound that's how you assess the brain right <clears throat> and then so what you do is you need to give high full of oxygen so that is the first thing whenever you see a pain whoever the inflation you, you encounter first thing is to give oxygen where variable performance mask right 10 to 15 milliliters per minute so that is the first thing and if patient is not breathing enough 
you have you assess the patient breathing not breathing enough then you have to, to begin it you have to give bag mask ventilation right and then of course you have to intubate and ventilate if patient require access assist breathing assistance right and then if there are issues in the, the chest which uh, prevent or which uh, uh, <coughs> affect breathing like pneumothoraxes, hemothoraxes, you need to diagnose them and this, this need to be diagnosed clinically not by x-rays right uh, and then you need to attend to them then and there. <coughs> if it is tension pneumothorax you need to decompress then and there and if you see a, a, an open pneumothorax you need to seal off. Well, I'll show you how to seal off later. So that's how you do. <coughs> and then if you are intubate the patient and you start ventilating, then there are a few other things you can do. We can connect the patient, check the carbon dioxide in the um, ET tube, ET carbon dioxide. These are, these are called adjuncts to your primary cell. We'll discuss them a little bit later. And pulse oximeter will be helpful to check whether the patient is having good oxygen saturation, right? So that's how you assess and um, stabilize breathing. So what are, the, what are the issues you might encounter in a patient who has sustained significant uh, chest injury? So pneumothorax is one, could be simple pneumothorax or open pneumothorax or tension, right? Hemothorax, multiple refractures, flail segments, and lung contusion, right? Those are the chest, important chest injuries and obstructed airways can be tracheal bronchial injuries and sometimes can be neurological problems like spinal cord injuries or head injuries which suppress the breathing effort. So those are the, the common issues you may uh, encounter <coughs> uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> right there are, there are a lot of questions coming uh, uh, right so so these are the important problems so yeah, the injuries you might have to encounter you might see in your patient so you need to uh, see them uh, diagnose them okay Right. There's a question. So there are a lot of questions coming. Um, uh, yes, I will uh, continue and uh, shall yeah, we discuss yeah. them at the end of the lecture? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's good. Right. Uh, Right, this is just x-ray uh, let's indicate tension neutral actually speaking you should not see this kind of x-rays right so this is an accidental x-ray actually so if you diagnose now tension pneumothorax you need to diagnose clinically right you and if you diagnose tension pneumothorax you don't send patient for x-rays right and if you do that you will kill the patient on the way so if you diagnose tension pneumothorax clinically and decompress it then and there right these x-rays are accidental x-rays right i mean you should not see this x-rays actually so uh, so how would you diagnose tension pneumothorax right um so so can anybody tell i don't think that anybody is going to answer right so i think uh, later on um, I, i'll be discussing this again some, uh, somewhere else uh, <coughs> so that is what uh, tension neutral is x-ray this is how it looks like uh, so that's one thing so if you diagnose tension pneumothorax, <coughs> what you need to do is you need to decompress it. So, so tension pneumothorax, one way it, it will affect your patient's breathing because one lung is definitely collapsed and another lung is also going to, going to compress. So breathing is going to definitely affect. So that is not the main issue here. When it, when this happens, you can see the mediastinum is pushed to the other side. So when that happen, the thoracic cavity now, pressure inside thoracic cavity is high. And we, because of that, and the, the pushing of this media stand will kink your vessel, great vessel, especially the veins, right? So the patient end up with having acute heart failure. So that is why they die. Because of the kinking and pressure in the thoracic cavity will compress or collapse the vessel, veins mainly, causing acute um, cardiac failure. So that's why you need to quickly put, the, put a needle into this um, affected side and decompress this tension. So the earlier this, the, the description was to insert the biggest available cannula into the second intercostal space midclavicular line. So that is the teaching and that is 
still accepted. But if you read the reverse version of ATLS guideline, they say they they, they, they advise to go for the, the usual site of intercostal tube insertion, that is the safe triangle. That is uh, <coughs> anterior axillary uh, the anterior axillary line, mid axillary line, and fifth rib, right? In that space somewhere you can put a needle. So that was the acceptable. Both are acceptable, even if you answer that it is mid clavicle line second space um, or if you say that it is a safe triangle we as no, no newer version say the safe triangle it doesn't really matter right whatever the place you um, put a big needle and let the air out so let the tension now you can't get the whole layout out you get the tension now or the pressure out that is what you need so if you if you relieve the pressure then heart will come back to the, the correct place and the veins will open up and end up with the heart failure or acute heart failure will be sorted. So, but the definitive treatment would be to put a proper intercostal drain in the safe triangle. So that will uh, cure the proper, treat the problem, right? Until you get ready with the intercostal tube uh, uh, thingy, you put a needle to buy time, okay? Right. No. All right. So this is open pneumothorax, right? So it's the, there's a big wound in the chest cavity, which open into the chest cavity. So yeah, each time the, the person is breathing, yeah, will go in and out through this hole. So yeah, movement in the lungs will be affected. Both side lungs will be affected because of this yeah, sucking wound. <coughs> so affected side lung anyway will collapse. But uh, even other lung is going to be affected because air will be moving now between two lungs, right? Not to the, uh, the airway, right? So this again, if you don't treat, they will die. So what you do is, like in this picture, you clean the wound quickly and put a big gauze uh, so on, on the wound and put uh, on top of that, you put some uh, like um, uh, some polythene towel. But you can, in the hospital, what you can do is you can get a urine bag or something which can cut it, cut, cut a piece of it and put there and stick three sides and leave one side open. So this is, this act as now flap well. So it will allow the air to escape from the chest cavity and it will not allow the air to suck in. So, so that is how it works. So, and then the, so this is kind of temporizing measure. So until you get the things ready or when you want to transport or when you want to trans, transfer patient to uh, the hospital or when you when you uh, um, have no time to um, insert intercostal tube then you can do this so the, but the, the correct treatment is to close this wound and then in, insert a proper intercostal tube so that is it that is how you treat um, open pneumothorax right so those are i mean there are other uh, injuries as well i mean these are important uh, uh, i mean immediate life threatening uh, problem which can uh, compromise patients breathing right we'll check we'll talk about the, the other injuries later uh, so next you no know, you have come across a and b and now the next letter is c right uh, c is for circulation and hemorrhage control and one important thing i have to mention whenever now you establish the airway first with the cervical spine and then you attend to breathing and we solve that out and then you come to the circulation and then you are going to sort out the circulation problem. But whenever you see a problem, right, if you see that if you have done airway when breathing, now we are going to bring circulation, but you suddenly realize that patient saturation is dropping, right? So in that case, what you need to do is you have to go for A first again, right? You don't go to B. You instead you have to go for A and you check the RV is okay whether the trachea is the intercostal tube is in place, whether it's locked or not, and then come to B and see whether there any, any problem in the in the, uh, the chest now, whether the intercostal tube is kinked or not. Likewise, you need to go to A again, not not don't start from the B or uh, um, any other thing place, right? So whenever you encounter a problem when you are going down in your A, B, C, D, E, or even after that. You need to go to A first and then go down, come down. So that's how you manage uh, this critical patient, okay? Circulation. So, so, do you, uh, so what are the problems? So 
when, when you're managing circulation, so you have to identify the source of bleeding. So it could be external bleeding or more importantly, internal bleeding. So external bleeding you can see in, your, in the patient's throat and um, type of injuries patient has sustained. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and um, so that's important whether the patient bleeding internally or outside, right? We'll talk a little bit more later. And then how do we assess patient? You check pulse rate, rhythm rate, volume, and paradox. The pulse, there is same pulse paradox, which indicate some tension in the chest, right? Uh, and skin color, capillary refilling time, and blood pressures. So the, with these parameters, you know, we can guess, we can understand what's the circulation, circulation status of the patient. So it's how you assess your patient, right? And <coughs> And, and if you encounter external bleeding, obvious artery function and gushing blood, you can, what is the best thing is to go for direct compression. You put a gauze or whatever the thing you have, you have direct pressure. Or you can put a crepe bandage. If it is a limb, you put a drip, uh, gauze towel and uh, wrap around it a uh, compression bandage. So, right. And tourniquet, of course, I mean, tourniquet, of course, for limb, of course, you can try, but Again, with caution, right? If it is in the field, you don't have any support. Then, of course, life is more important than the limb. In that case, you can put a tourniquet, right? But in the hospital setup, of course, you don't have to go for it. You have other measures to um, control bleeding. So, best thing is to do compression. In the field, if you do, if you sustain something, and if you don't have anything else, in if some, if your friend or whatever, you don't have any support, then of course, putting a tourniquet and sacrificing that limb is okay to save the patient's life uh, but if you have put a tourniquet you need to you need to un undo it within 40 minutes or so otherwise you are going to have the limb loss right and important thing is to get the iv access largest large bow cannula in uh, both anticubital fossae that is the place to insert and you have to then look for concealed bleeding and uh, <coughs> And whenever we are putting cannula, you need to draw some blood for uh, important investigation, basic blood investigation and blood cross matching. And until you get ready with fluids, blood, you need to give crystalloid, right? And now, of course, recommendation is supposing now you, you have diagnosed patient is losing a lot and have already lost a blood a lot, then patient need blood, right? If you are lost, if patient has lost a lot, then you have to replace the loss with blood and blood product, not by water, right? So just to buy time, you can give about 500 ml or one liter of crystalloid until you get ready with the blood. So that is what the recommendation. You don't, don't keep on pumping a lot of saline that will cause more damage than actual um, help, okay? So when you are giving a lot of fluid, you need to think about this hypothermia as well because you are, when you are giving a lot of fluids, they tend to, uh, you tend to give anyway, however much you warm the stuff, you are going to, going to cause hypothermia. That is a, a killer. So we'll discuss, you know, that you must have heard about this little triad. Um, hypothermia is one of them, right? And this is the famous saying, what you call, blood on the floor and FOMO. So that is the thing we have to remember. Blood on the floor means whatever the external bleeding. You can see outside the injuries and wet clothes, soap, blood everywhere. So that is what you can see. But the more important thing is the FOMO. So where else this he is or she is bleeding? So these are internal bleeders. So what are the cavities? Somebody can bleed. The chest cavity, the abdomen, pelvis and long bone fractures, right? So those are the, uh, those are the <coughs> uh, concealed sites of bleeding. So you need to look for these concealed sites of bleeding if you are suspecting that patient is bleeding, right? Right, so that's how you go. So if patient has lost a lot of fluids, then patient can be in shock. Shock is a general term. So if it is tissue hypoxia, generalized tissue hypoxia due to problem in the circulation. So that's, there are a lot of definition for shock, but it's a simple thing to understand is it's a tissue hypoxia generalized, not one single finger right so generalized tissue hypoxia due to circulatory issue right so that is shock 
So shock, uh, there can, depending on the etiology, you can classify shock into various names. But shock is shock, but whatever the thing it triggers, ultimate outcome is tissue hypoxia, right? So depending on the etiology, you can classify. So, but when, when it comes to trauma, of course, we are really worried about this hypovolemia or hemorrhagic shock. There are other, other situations like cardiogenic, cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax, and cardiac tamponade, of course, is again end up with heart failure. And neurogenic shock, we must have learned these things, septic shock, but in emergency talk, full of uh, major injuries, we are really worried about hemorrhagic shock. So, and as I said, commonest cause of shock following trauma is hemorrhage, right? And most, um, I mean, if you look at the second peak, the deaths are due to hemorrhage, right? Uh, and you can classify hemorrhage into various classes, right? Class one to six, five, four. Remember that some this is not classes of shock, right? Shock has shock, shock of course uh, um, has only two types. No, you have reversible shock and irreversible, irreversible shock. Uh, but it hasn't got any classes as such, right? What you have classes for is hemorrhage, right? We have, have class one hemorrhage, class two hemorrhage, and class three and class four hemorrhage, right? Class one is up to like, no, you don't have to remember this graph, the whatever chart by heart. Um, but if you can easily, you can easily understand this, right? Uh, don't, I mean, this, this, uh, the volumes are given for a patient who is about 30 kilos of weight. But if you can go by the percentage, it's easy for, I mean, Class one is less than 15% and class two is 15, 30% and class three is 30, 40 and more than that, uh, for more than 40 is class four. So that is the easier way to remember uh, if you want to remember. But during, I mean, if you look at the class one, I mean, so for normal healthy person, that is of course not a big deal, right? Uh, you won't even see any significant uh, physical uh, um, Physiological, physiological parameter changes like except if you check the system or if your blood pressure sometimes diastolic pressure can go a little bit higher high because they because of compensated mechanisms uh, patient will um, i mean sympathetic overdrive will cause um, uh, peripheral resistance to increase so we, that because of that you will get um, I mean, narrow pulse pressure and increase uh, diastolic pressure that is what you might see even you might not even see a tachycardia so <clears throat> for those uh, class one hemorrhage you can just give a bit of crystalloid and and if patient is not going to lose continuously uh, that is good enough for a normal person right class two of course you will see, tend to see things uh, you tend to see the abnormality like your patient will develop tachycardia and uh, and uh, and uh, and even the urine output also now becoming a little lower, right? And patients start to breathe faster than usual. And um, blood pressure is uh, now in class two, we get tachycardia mainly, right? So class three, we get blood pressure crashing now. In class two, we'll see blood pressure dro uh, dropping. And class four is patient is uh, profoundly hypertensive and even unconscious and uh, like that, okay? So, in class one, you might not see any significant physiological differences. In class two, you get tachycardia mainly and a little bit of dropping in urine output. Class three, you will get uh, profound, I mean, significant tach tachycardia plus dropping blood pressure, right? So dropping blood pressure, that's the important class three. And class four is profound hypotension and tachycardia and patient conscious level will, will be altered. Even patient can be unconscious, right? And this is of course, not only bleeding, even during following trauma, the other reasons also, there are other reasons for someone to lose intravascular volume. One thing is this um, soft tissue edema, right? Soft tissue injury can sequestrate a third space loss. And because of inflammation, systemic inflammation also cause capillary to leak a lot. So we end up with um, um, losing intravascular volume because of this uh, leaking capillary as well. So you need to think about that also when you're replacing fluids, okay? Right, well, what is the initial fluid therapy? So I, to, until you get the blood ready, you can give crystalloid, warm crystalloid, ring lactate or normal cell, both are equal. You can give out for an adult one, uh, less than one liter, like 
500 ml or 2 1 liter now even if you read through new, newer version of uh, ATLS the, the 10th edition they say you only bought one, one unit that is 500 ml not more than that if patient required more than that of fluids that means that patient required blood right um, so that is what don't give a lot of um, fluids uh, crystalloid if if you think that patient required a lot of fluid you need to start giving blood then blood product is um, from the beginning right and adults uh, initial dose size in 500 for one liter and for children 20 mil for kg per body weight right and how would you assess uh, the response of course you can check the output uh, peripheral perfusion, your capillary refill time, patient conscious level should regain, blood gas analysis will show um, improvement as your base access will be improved and um, lactate will improve, in a lactate you can check whether it is going to improve and, cap and if you can put central line then you can check the central venous pressure as well. For class 1 hemorrhage of course, <coughs> for the normal adult person even uh, giving crystalloid is enough, right? That if patient is not going to bleed a lot, then uh, that is if patient not continue to bleed, then of course uh, crystalloid is enough. But beyond that, you might have to give blood then blood product. So depending on your response to fluids, you can classify your patients into uh, three three classes, right? Three groups like rapid responses, responders, and transient responses non or minimal responders. Rapid responders are those who have lost uh, less, I mean, less than 20% or some, so uh, fluid, like in class one bleeding. So there is no, there is no ingoing loss and patient, if you, when you give a uh, fluid blow loss, the blood pressure and pulse rate remains stable and patient's conscious and everything, right? And he's producing urine. So rapid responders are easy. They have lost some blood, but there's no ongoing loss and that the amount of loss is less than say, about 20%. So those people, of course, you can easily manage, right? So those are rapid responders. And then you have another class called transient responders. When you give fluid bolus, blood pressure picks up, heart rate goes down. And as you uh, maintain, when you give maintenance doses, then patient after a few hours or so after a few minutes, 30 minutes or so, they again start crashing. So, so that I indicate Either you have not enough, given enough fluid, for the, the initial loss is great and your, your assessment of blood loss is not correct. So you have not given enough fluid. So that could be one reason. And other reason is patient is continue to bleed somewhere, which is you have missed to diagnose, right? So ongoing loss. So transient responders are the one. So your treatment is you can give another bolus and see what's happening and vigorously or look for a source of loss right it could be some conceived bleeding and you treat treat that right <coughs> and the other classes worst ones are the minimal or non-responders they these are the people who have lost a lost lot to begin with and either they are losing blood somewhere uh, exsanguinated maybe ruptured liver or spleen or large vessel right something like that so these people of course um, there are high chance of mortality, but uh, now depending on the situation, you might even try and do surgery or intervention to uh, you to patch out patch off this uh, whatever the bleed, right? Unless you do that, unless treat this the loss, you are going to lose these people, right? So those are the minimum responders or non-responders. So those people require immediate uh, surgery or some sort of intervention to stop bleeding. And you might come across these words, right? Permissive hypotension during resuscitation. And sometimes you might hear another words like balanced resuscitation, hypotensive resuscitation, and control resuscitation. Those there are a lot of names, but they are almost similar uh, meaning. So whenever when when you are when when you treating a patient who is losing blood or after trauma, so you your idea is to uh, um not to achieve the normal blood pressure and no, blood pressure of that person because if you increase blood pressure whatever the patient's normal level 
if patient is has he patient might even start rape daily suppose if somebody is having liver laceration and if you get his blood pressure back to normal whatever the pressure he had before uh, whatever the hemostatic clot can re dislodge and re restart daily so that is very detrimental so what you need when you are resuscitating your patient is to achieve the physiology back right you get your organ perfused like the brain the heart and the kidneys and the gut perfused that is enough enough right until you sort his uh, whatever the injury right so you don't have to achieve the normal blood pressure so if you if you are going by mean arterial pressure map right if you can achieve 65 to 70 millimeter mercury of mean arterial pressure that's map that is good enough so that will good enough to maintain the brain and the heart and the kidneys and the gut right so that is your goal so you don't have to main bring up patient systolic blood pressure to 120 or 30 so that is that is called permissive hypotension right so you check that and then no, depending on that you try to the volume you are going to give okay um so i think i have mentioned about this uh, giving a lot of crystalloid uh, crystalloid uh, will lead to what you call this lethal triad right so lethal triad is acidosis and hypothermia and coagulopathy so initially uh, if you read earlier books they talk about coagulopathy hypothermia and acidosis that's lethal triad but if you read read newer version of this trauma like atls 10 edition they call talk about early coagulopathy not the coagulopathy coagulopathy is well i mean now already said right you if your patient is having coagulopathy that means patient is almost now he is in irreversible kind of shock so they, you can't actually salvage them now so you need to detect them early stage like when um when full-blown coagulopathy sets in you need to diagnose them early right when their platelets count is dropping when they are uh, APT is slightly increasing then that's the time you need to intervene right and when you are what is APT is when when they, they say they, we can't calculate AP, whatever APT then there's no point so that is beyond your I mean, uh, the salvage uh, to the threshold right so now the term that they use is early coagulopathy that is lethal time you don't wait until patient develop coagulopathy you need to attend to them there uh, when they develop early signs of coagulopathy okay so that is newer new version what they say about digital trial early coagulopathy hypothermia and acidosis right so all these things happen if you keep on giving a lot of fluids just uh, saline or crystalloid okay so you need to make a decision to give fluid uh, blood and blood products very early right right blood and blood products you need to give early right so if you want if your patient can stand for a while so you can give cross-matched group specific blood for your patient so that will take about 30 even 40 minutes sometime depending on your hospital right so if you can if patient can stay that long you best thing is to go for cross-matched uh, blood products so that's the least i mean then less less chance of getting reactions things like that but if you don't have that much of time then you have to go, go for group specific blood sometime uh, if that was not enough um, there is no time at all then you have to go for all negative blood to begin with right mm, so that's how you go for blood products right and uh, <clears throat> and of course this auto transfusion of course i mean in trauma situation very difficult to set in but um these are machines are available now in other part of the world you I mean, your country i think i don't know if it's available at the moment so we can take patient own i mean when supposing patient bleeding from the liver or something we, when you're doing a program you can suck the blood patient own blood and filter them and then uh, reinfuse that is auto transfusion but it's very difficult to set in uh, massive i mean trauma situation it, it might uh, be difficult but it is doable and of course sometimes a patient might need massive transfusion straight away right in that case you need to alert the blood bank and activate that protocol right massive transfusion protocol then the blood bank will um, send you the relevant uh, uh, stuff now earlier when we were learning uh, we used to talk about one unit of paxil and one unit of ffp and one unit of cryo that is that is what uh, or not and um, platelet so 
it's basically you reconstruct the blood then give that is what you learn but if you read newer things now they they go for the box system uh, first box second box and third box like in i mean i think it's better for you to uh, read, um, go through this I and mean, if you go to blood when you go to blood blank ask them uh, what is what is there in first box and what is there in second box and what is third whatever what is how, how you use um, give these things in, in cycles like uh, you need to remember right it's better to remember right right that is it uh, then uh, um, right as I said this early coagulopathy you need to diagnose them at early stage early coagulopathy present in about 30 percent of the people with massive trauma right that is important so you need to treat them so you might have your platelets and give a FFP and cryo and things like that so contract this hemodilution and things like that okay um, and hypothermia you need to uh, treat and you need to prevent hypothermia developing uh, and uh, and of course this tranexamic acid you can you can give one gram of tranexamic acid at the beginning and they can give another dose later on please um, i think uh, i mean if you even search internet they will talk about this uh, massive transfusion protocol newer version right when to give transfusion acid and when to repeat it likewise these things are there now right they might question you right right um, right so important thing is no if your patient is bleeding important thing is to close the tap right unless you close whatever you give will go into leak out so if patient is continuing to bleed somewhere, then you need to patch off this, right? Sometimes you might need open surgery, uh, or if uh, your hospital is equipped to do things like endovascular intervention, like you can embolize this bleeding vessel endovascularly, then of course it's possible. But those things, of course, you can't get in an emergency setup. I mean, if you are in, in very developed sort of places, they have these emergency endovascular intervention procedures, but in our part of the world still not available these procedures uh, in, I mean, in short notice right so that is even though they mentioned about I, mean, I don't think that in our part of the world anybody is doing at the moment uh, okay so this is just a few just one few words about this what you call damage control surgery so if your patient is bleeding or something like that you need to do a quick fix for this uh, bleeding right so that is called damage control so there what you do is uh, basically during this kind of surgery what you do is you stop bleeding and if supposing patient is already having some bowel injury or urinary injury something like that so patient is going to have contamination so you need to prevent or you can you have to contain this contamination that is second objective of doing damage control surgery and preventing further injury so when you are doing what you call this damage control procedures like emergency laparotomy what you try to try to do is somehow try to stop bleeding so for, suppose it's a big vessel bleeding you can tie this blood vessel if the liver is bleeding you can pack it with some packs and if the spleen is, spleen is bleeding you take the spleen out something like that so that is control bleeding right and supposing if the patient is having bowel injury, then of course, uh, if you leave that, the bowel continue is going to leak and end up with peritonitis. So that will going to kill the patient. So to prevent that, either you can tie those ends or you can bring them out as stomas, right? Rather than going and rejoining these uh, torn uh, guts at that time, uh, you, you just take them out and um, do a stoma, so you even tie them off for a while and then come out right so that is called damage control so by doing that what you are achieving is to get the physiology back not the anatomy you are, if you are not going to track uh, correct the anatomy during this damage control procedures right so uh, so you control the physiological change you control physiological changes and then when the patient is stable enough you take the patient back to theatre after maybe 48 hours or 72 hours and then when patient is blood pressure is normal and is producing urine and things like that you go back and do whatever the anatomical correction later on right that is called damage control so this uh, sometimes these words can come, come up 
uh, then you know what to do, right? What to what it means. Uh, actually, this word. Uh, Hmm. And that's word actually originate from uh, actually this um, the navy actually right this damage control uh, especially when it's this war time during the first especially in the first world war in 1980 uh, at that period when 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 the battleship damaged what they do is we they quickly patch off the leaks or whatever and then engage in the battle right rather than taking the ship back to the, the whatever the harbor or dry dock and try to repair it they just whatever the available it's whatever the available um, things is, they patch off whatever the thing in the hole in the ship and engage in the battle so you just keep the, the ship afloat and then engage in the battle so that is called damage control so same thing we are doing with the patient so just Get the patient float with with his physiology. You get the blood pressure, and you get the pulse, and you, you get the kidney functioning, and get the brain functioning, and then give some time to patient to settle settle down and get the acidosis correct and coagulopathy correct, and and then the volume correction, and then uh, then when the, when when those things settle, then you can leisurely go back with the patient to theater, and then uh, do the relevant corrective uh, surgeries like anastomosis and things like that. If you try to do this anastomosis and things like that, where blood pressure is 60 or something, then definitely this anastomosis is going to leak, right? And then you have more problem. And if you keep the patient open for a long time, the patient will end up with hypothermia and then uh, again, he might die. So that is why damage control surgery is important when you're managing patient uh, in emergency setup, okay? So that is about your C circulation and then comes a D disability. Disability is neurological disability, right? It is a brief uh, kind of neurological examination. We are not going to do full blown um, neurological examination what you do when you are doing neurology, right? Basically, you do three, three things. One thing is check the conscious level and check the pupils and then check for any localizing or lateralizing sign. Patients, the patients having those things that is very brief thing so how to check the, the conscious level is you talk to patient and there is a, there are two system um, in trauma setup we can utilize one thing is called the simple simple version is avpu system that is we just check the patient with the patient alert and with the patient will respond to verbal response or will the patient respond to pain or unresponsive that is of course we are not using for a single individual patient that is useful when you are dealing with mass casualty. When you see a lot of patients, you don't have time to do full examination. Then you just check whether the patient is alert or not, and then that kind of situation. But if you are dealing with only one patient, when you have time, then you have to go for this GCA, so Glasgow, Glasgow coma scale. So that's how you check the conscious level. And then um, uh, pupils, you check the pupil size and symmetry and reaction to light and any other uh, anomalies. That is next thing, and then look for whether the patient has got any say, obvious uh, neurological sign like cranial nerve palsy, hemiplegia, paraplegia, or spinal level, or sensory level, things like that. Okay, the gross thing. So this is uh, you know conscious level you this simple avpu system with the alert respond to verbal command respond to pain no unresponsive so this is for triaging right not for single uh, individual person right and glass coma scale I, mean, I, I don't have to explain it you go by three parameters eye opening verbal response and best mode response and you give the value and this is very important now if it, this is come as low as low as Eight or below, then you know that patient cannot maintain his or her airway um, without support. So you need to intubate the patient, right? So that is important things. And but again, this can be sometimes misleading, but you have to uh, be careful about it. Some uh, from okay. For example, the patient already intubated, you can't go go about go about to a verbal response, isn't it? If patient has already been paralyzed, then of course you can't assess. The GCS um, in the same way, okay. But uh, for trauma setup, this is the best what we can actually go do. Do GCS, and that is the best 
in available, right? Pupils, look at the size and symmetry and then reaction. Reaction to light. So that is what you do in trauma setup in, in your primary survey, right? And look for any lateralizing sign, cranial nerve palsy, hemiplegia, sensory loss, weakness, paraplegia, sensory level, these things you can, can quickly do. So that is what you do. So in, in D, you do three things. You check the conscious level, check the pupils, and check whether he, has, he or she has got any localizing or lateralizing signs. So those that is what you do during your um, D, right? Right. When the D is done, then you move to E, right? Again, I will remind you, if you, now by, by this time, now we are, we are doing D, and you realize that patient saturation has dropped again. So in that case, again, you have to go back to A, right? Don't start with B or, supposing patient blood pressure came down, right? So you have stabilized blood pressure. Now when you are doing exposure E, you realize that blood pressure is going down and tachycardia development. So in that case, you don't go to C, right? You need to go to A first and then check A and then B and come to C and then sort that out quickly, right? Understand? So this is, this is very important. Go back to A, go back to A first and then come back, right? Right. So exposure, of course, the last in, in your primary survey, that is the last letter, you expose the patient appropriately and check for all, all the injuries. And then we have to undress the patient and Remember to prevent hypothermia. Uh, as soon as you undress and you, as soon as you check the things and you have to cover the patient with some bank blanket or something to prevent hypothermia, right? You think that this country is hot and you won't develop hypothermia, but it is not the case. Our hospitals now in the theater setup or ED, they are air conditions already. And when the patient is already given fluids and and is exposed, it's very, it's definitely going to lose heat. So it doesn't really matter about the, the ambient temperature, right? You need to cover the patient, right? Otherwise, it is very, um, very bad actually, right? And for the now you you undress the patient. Sometimes you have to cut the the what the garment with a pair of scissors, uh, and then uh, then uh, remove the clothes and uh, and then examine the front, and then then you have to check the back. So what, for that, you need to roll the patient, right? Remember that you have not excluded any cervical or spinal, cervical spine or any other spine injury. You are still in the primary survey. What you are doing is protection of the spine, not to di not diagnosing cervical, not diagnosing spine injury, just to protect the spine. Just to protect the spine, you need to lock roll the patient. You don't twist the patient, right? So you ro roll the patient as a one, uh, one, 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 one segment, one, one thing, right? Not, don't, don't twist the patient. You need to roll as if you are rolling a log, right? So, so I think we, we will teach how to log roll. This is ATLS way of log rolling with minimum number of people. You need to have four people. So the first, the, this is what is what is a leader, right? He, she, she commands, he or he commands, and these are the helpers, right? Uh, so this person, this uh, the person taking care of the head and the neck is the most experienced person and he, he or she is leading the things and these two people are helping and this third, fourth person is examining and when they are done, you need to pay, put the patient back in the place, right? So this thing you need to uh, rehearse first and or uh, talk through and then of course you have to do it, right? In between, in, in, the, in the halfway of the procedure, you can't change the procedure, right? Uh, you have to tell everything beforehand, then only do it and put the patient back in the place and then only change the thing, right? Right, we will de do this thing as you come for the clinical side. I think, I think we will teach them. Um, I, I think you must have already had some uh, experience regarding this during your anesthesia appointment, I think. Right, so that is for log rolling. And as you come, to, um, as you are doing your primary survey, there are a few things you, I mean, all the time what we did was the examination and doing various uh, intervention, right? Giving fluids, put, putting tubes, putting intub intubation, things like that. But during that primary survey, you can do few investigation, rather not investigation, few things, 
other extra things. They are, we are called, we call them adjuncts, not really investigation as such. For, for during a primary survey, you do this adjuncts. So one thing is you can do arterial blood gas or lactates to see whether the patient getting enough oxygenation, right? So that is one adjunct you can do. And it is carbon dioxide is to see whether you have correctly intubated the patient, carbon dioxide uh, check, you can check, right? And ECG monitor, you know that normal ECG monitor you can connect the patient to the monitor there and urine catheter and NG tube if required, if indicated only, you can put NG tube. Right. If you are suspecting cervical um, basal uh, fra skull fracture, you are not going to put NG tube, right? And chest X-ray. Remember that you are not going to do tele chest or standing X-ray. You are doing AP X-ray while the patient is lying down, right? And pelvic X-ray you can do during your primary survey. And fast scan. We'll discuss a little bit more. And you can do what you call DPL diagnostic patient lavage. I will discuss them later in a little bit more detail, right? So fast scan is uh, focus assessment of sonography in trauma, right? That is actually not an investigation, right? This is done by the the, uh, the primary doctor, first doctor uh, encounters patient. It is an extension of your physical examination, right? So you know, the usual fast scan, it has got only four views. Now we can see in this picture, you have pericardial view that is just below your sternum. So we stand up and write upper quadrant view and the upper quadrant and sub suprapubic view. So in these views, uh, you are checking the liver, the pericardial view, you look at the heart for effusion um, or tamponade and right side you do look for the liver and medicine pouch to see free fluids and the quadrant for the spleen and the uh, fluid there and kidney and suprapubic view look at the pelvis and free fluid and bladder in the uh, in the pelvis, right? So this is, there are some pictures now in, in the right now. This is normal picture. You can see liver and kidney in between. You can get, see some fat in the Morrison pouch. That's normal. But if you look at the other picture on the other side, you can see some dark stuff there that is blood. So in between, this is liver and this is kidney. In between, you can see red, no, the black thing that is blood. So free fluid, right? So that is positive uh, right upper quadrant. The left upper quadrant. So this is spleen and kidney. Again, you can see there's just a tiny line between two, two structures. There are nothing in between, but in here, you can see a black thing that is fluid. In formal situation, this is blood, right? Unless you prove otherwise. So this is pelvis. You can see the bladder normal. And in outside, but you can see some black stuff that is again fluid. In formal situation, this is blood unless proved otherwise, right? So this is pericardial view. You can see the four chambers of the heart. It's so normal, this is a huge gap in between in the, the pericardial sac now. There's a lot of fluid in there. If it is force traumatic thing, you, this could be cardiac, uh, pericardial uh, blood to uh, tampon on from. So what is DPL? Not finish. DPL is critical diagnostic parental lavage. I mean, this is now going out of fashion. I mean, since you have uh, Fast scan, and then no, hardly ever we do this. There are rare indications to do. How you do is, of course, uh, you have to make a small hole in your tummy. And like in your, the you should have, if you must have seen this PD dialysis, you can put the same catheter, like with a small cut in your belly button area and put this catheter and then uh, instill about one liter of warm saline and say, wait about 10, 15 minutes and then take the fluid out and analyze, right? If you when you're analyzing, if you see these things like frank blood or blood bubble contain, that is your positive DUPA. Let me indicate that indicate intra-abdominal injury. But if you can't see them, obviously, then you have to look this under a microscope. If you see red cell more than one lakh per one cubic millimeter or white blood cell more than 500, that is considered positive. And if you see bacteria again, that indicate bowel injury. So, so that is... Uh, why, right? Uh, we do DPL, of course, DPL you don't do in each and every patient. Now, and one advantage of DPL is uh, it is more sensitive for bowel injury. For your scan, ultrasound scan will not detect bowel injuries. But if you're suspecting bowel injuries, DPL is superior because you can see bowel contents, right? If you see full stuff coming in your fluid, it indicates there's bowel injury, right? And it is not good for retroperitoneal injury because you know whatever the injury should be intraperitoneal to get DPL positive. 
you could do bowel injury or bleeding in intraperitoneal in only you get if it is bleeding retroperitoneal like in uh, kidney injuries you won't get dpl positive right so that is the problem okay so since we have our sound scan and now we have ct scan also now dpl is of course going uh, almost out of fashion very rare indications are they like in supposing you have a patient with who is very unstable in the icu uh, you can't take the patient to the um, ct scanner or for the even ultrasound scanner then of course you can do dpl because in the, in the icu itself so that will give you a good um, um, findings so that is the only thing i can now of course think about uh, the indication like uh, really we do a dpl now okay and at the end of the primary survey so that is the end of the primary survey. You have A, B, C, D, E done, and then you have some adjuncts. We have done those tests. And then at the end of the survey, you need to make a decision, important one. One thing is, of course, you reassess A, B, C, and see whether the patient is stable. And then when the patient is stable, A, B, C, D, E wise, then you have to make a decision. Depending on the injury, uh, then you have to then we have to decide whether the patient needs to be keep in your hospital whether you can manage his or her injuries in your hospital or you need to transport the patient to some other hospital right so it is very important don't waste now suppose the patient is already having an injury which need some higher level intervention like suppose somebody is having head injury which need to be attended uh, then and there or, car, or chest injury or cardiac injury whatever then don't waste time doing other tests in your hospital. You quickly transport patient to the relevant hospital but without wasting time. So this is very important, right? Sometimes you, you keep on doing unnecessary limb x-rays uh, and wasting time while patient developing large ADH in the brain, right? So that is very important. At the end of the primary survey, you quickly make a decision whether this patient need to be transported to or transferred to different hospital or not. If you can, if you make the decision then of course um, you can save a lot of time <laughs> right, but supposing if you, are, if you have decided to keep the patient in your hospital then you have to start what you call secondary service what you do is there of course you have to take a history so that is your ample history right ample is a for allergies m for medication with patient is already on if can if you can get this information from right and pass medical history l for is last meal an event is uh, the whatever the event which lead to the injury like or mechanism things like that i mean can you easily understand what it means and then then you have to do head to toe full examination right rechecking pupils and bleeding check um, if the head part you can check everything the scalp bleeding eyes foreign bodies <coughs> and gcs which recheck gcs uh, inspect the ear uh, csf leaking ent bleeding uh, skull fractures, bogey masses, right? Maxillofacial fracture, dental fractures, and neck. And this is battle sign. No, this 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 neck. This is this is called battle sign. It indicate fracture base of the skull. And you, this is a subconjugal hemorrhage, which continue posteriorly. You can't see the posterior wall. That indicate uh, again fracture base of the skull. And so in the neck area, right? During your log rolling process, pro process, you can check this, right? Cervical, cervical spine, any any deformities, bumps, tender points, uh, and any steps, crepitus, emphysema, subcutaneous emphysema, right? So that's what I will do in the neck part, right? Chest again, inspect everything, penetrating injuries, bruises, subcutaneous emphysema, and crepitus, hemothorax, pneumothorax, and breath sound, recheck everything, pericardial diffusion. Right, all those things you need to recheck, right? Abdomen, inspect whole abdomen and palpate, right? And look for any injuries, outside injuries, you might indicate internal injuries like external bruises and penetrating injuries, evisceration, right? And um, and then you have to for fluids, things like that. And also it for bowel sound. And then you have perineum, look for hematomas, contusion, laceration, uterine injuries. Blood at the meters is important. Uh, rectal examination, blood in the uh, finger indicates rectal injury, and in sphincter tone indicates spinal injuries. Portion of the prostate, it indicates there's a distraction of prostate, that is urethral injury, right? Prostate can go up when there's a big hematoma uh, in the, uh, when there's a urethral injury which detaches the prostate. 
and body fragment indicate serious structure in right pelvic structure. You might see these things and uh, PV examination if indicated. Right, then this is blood at the meter. So this indicates urethral injury. You never, in, if you see this sign, you never put a catheter, right? Unless you uh, are experienced and what you need to do is you need to do a suprobic catheter and then uh, do a ascending urethrogram and get a urologist to look into this problem. You don't intervene, right? Catheterization is, uh, can cause injury uh, to become more serious. And the neurological examination, we have your pupils and GCS uh, and again lateralizing sign and check whole body to look for any spinal uh, levels, things like that, okay? All right, I'm going to do it fast now. And the muscle in, um, limb injuries, look for all these um, limbs, for fractures, deformities, and important thing is distal pulses and um, pelvic fractures. Right. And at the end of the secondary survey, now we have time because patient is stable now. Then you have to go for a specific investigation like head injury, CT scan and contrast intensity scan, spinal x-rays, CT spine, contrast study, right? Angiogram and extremity x-rays. Now these things you can do when the patient is stable and at the end of your secondary survey. Part of the actually is adjunct to the part secondary survey, right? So that will diagnose and um, and um, and and determine what are the injuries patient actually having, right? So that is that is your initial assessment. When you see a marginal operation, that is your initial assessment, your primary survey, and there are adjuncts, and then you go along the secondary survey and then do the relevant investigation. So so then at the end of secondary survey, you know that all the injuries patient is having. Right, so that is the first part of the talk. I don't think that is there enough time for you to discuss a little bit more than that, or do I need to ask a question now? So, can I just quickly go through a few, few um, uh, trunk injuries now, if you're not uh, um, asking questions. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. so there are a few questions they have asked. If you can quickly go through this, then we can uh, discuss the questions. There, there's about another half an hour more, I think. Yeah. All right. right now, a little bit about this um, trunk or torso injuries, chest and abdomen injury. Um, yeah, these are the important one now. Um, actually, chest injuries are common in mild trauma patients. Blunt, it can be blunt trauma, penetrating, or even impalement. Right? Uh, so, mine injuries, of course, if you see mine injury, it might indicate serious injury underneath, like contusion, abrasion, or even <laughs> laceration outside might indicate serious injury inside, like fractures or con uh, tension hemothorax or even hemothorax, right? That's very important. That's just, even if you see that outside injury is very minimal, inside it can be serious injury. And uh, the major injuries you can classify into two types, right? Immediate life-threatening injuries and potential life-threatening injuries in chest. Actually, there are six uh, serious, I mean, immediate life-threatening injury, if you don't detect them, uh, then then there you will lose patient, right? There are six in numbers and potential life threatening injuries again about six, seven, eight, I think. <laughs> this uh, will quickly go through one by one if possible. Uh, it's not going okay. Right, so these are, if you remember this uh, <coughs> immediate life threatening injuries like yeah, your obstruction like your tracheal injuries. Right? Yeah, your obstruction is one that can kill you, kill the patient immediately. So treatment is to get the proper or proper airway, get the airway sorted. And tension pneumothorax, you know that. Uh, open pneumothorax again it can kill flare chest and lung contusion again, another one. Massive hemothorax and cardiac tamponade. So those are the six severe injuries which can kill the patient in a matter of minutes, right? Not in numbers. I have airway obstruction, you can I think we have discussed earlier, or an injury, angle injury, upper chest injuries, tracheal injuries. So treatment is is uh, um, getting a airway sorted. <laughs> Tension pneumothorax, how we diagnose, patient will have a distress in respiration, cyanosis, engorged neck pain because of this tamponade effect, media standard shifting, uh, hyperacident hemithorax affected side and radiate based on the other side. So these, these are the features, right? 
So you don't wait for chest X-rays. And I told you earlier also, you do needle therapy synthesis and then uh, put the IC tube uh, later, right? So that will cure the problem. So this is, I show you again earlier also. Open your mosaic, I think I told you again. Earlier also, you, <coughs> these are air sucking wounds. Uh, so what you do is you cover like this, right? So that is for time, just to buy time and uh, treatment is to close this wound and put the intercostal tube um, in a different place, right? Not in the same place, okay? Right, that is again. Flare chest, of course, <coughs> It happened when there's a multiple refractors and there's part of the chest, no, chest, you know, it is like a cage, isn't it? So it's one signal unit. When you have multiple refractors, when the rib is broken, uh, one rib is broken more than one place, that part of the chest wall is now kind of freely floating. So that will, that part will paradoxical with the respiration, right? And that will, one thing, it will uh, affect the ventilation and other thing is, when you have a significant flare chest, that means underlying lung is severely damaged, right? So the lung condition, both actually contribute in the problem. So um, usually when you have a flare chest, definitely underlying lung is also damaged. So that is what, what is, that is the most serious problem actually, not the flare segment. This contused lung is the most serious problem. <laughs> like this, now we can understand the part of the uh, rib cage which is now freely floating, right? like in this picture, no? when the patient is inspirating that part will draw in and when he's expiring that part is uh, um, protrude out. So that will, uh, not only the affected lung, or even other lung is going to affect because lung, now the eye is going to move one lung to the other lung rather than out lung to the atmosphere, now the eye is breathing from one lung to the other one. So that will uh, affect uh, ventilation of both lungs, right? So these patients patient need to be ventilated sometime, okay? Massive hemothorax, of course, you can see in this picture. <coughs> so again, it's a serious problem. It is one thing it affects breathing plus the circulation, right? Your concealed bleeder, right? So a patient can get hypovolemia. And in this picture, you can see the one right lung is fully wiped out. So there is blood, right? And you can see the in the culprit also. There's a bullet there, right? All right. So you if you see massive hemothorax, the cost of the treatment. And if you need to give blood, right? If you are losing a lot of blood, you need to give blood. And if it's bleeding a lot continuously, that means there's a significant bigger vessel injury. So in that case, you might need to open and close the uh, patch of this uh, bleeder. And these are some of the potential life-threatening injuries. I just leave them. Out. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to discuss them in detail. Simple pneumothorax. For normal person can be tolerated, but supposing patient is having already COPD patient, just barely managing his normal life, simple pneumothorax can easily kill that sort of patient, right? So you have to be careful, right? Especially all people and all those who are having pre-existing lung problem or cardiac problem. Hemothorax, lung contusion, if you don't treat, it can be infected and get pneumonia and can, you can die. Tracheal bron bronchial injuries, blunt cardiac injuries, they can get cardiac contusion and can get arrhythmias and they can die. Uh, traumatic aortic ruptures, diaphragmatic injuries, esophageal ruptures can lead to mediastinitis and you can kill them. Now, this aortic rupture, you can see that widening of mediastinum there. <laughs> so, these one people require vascular intervention later, right? And this is diaphragmatic rupture. You can see bowel on the left side in the chest cavity and NG tube, this is NG tube, again, it's, it's coiling back to the chest. It indicates diaphragm has given away and now bowel is in the chest cavity. Right, so those are the, this is a little bit of abdominal injuries. I'm, I'm not going to go into detail a lot. So again, you can have blunt trauma like in the seat belt injury, right? And penetrating injury, it's evisceration and blast injury. Now, like this, so this thing we call impalement. Right? They come with the impending or the whatever the uh, whatever the, the injury, uh, whatever the weapon also, right? this impalement. Right? Uh, so abdominal injuries, of course, it comes in this, um, when you are doing initial assessment, it comes in your circulation part, no? the bleeding. Most important part is the bleeding. So abdomen has three places, can bleed, intra abdominal and retroperitoneal bleeding and pelvic bleeding. So it can bleed every drop of your blood into abdomen. Okay. 
And remember that part of your abdomen is covered by the ribcage and the pelvis. So any injury below the nipple level can be abdominal and any injury even in the buttock can be abdominal. Right? Remember that. And uh, diaphragm, uh, other injuries, um, abdominal injury like diaphragmatic trunk injuries, dual injuries, pancreatic injuries, and hollow viscous, that's bowel and other uh, hollow viscous injury, mesentric tears, GU injuries, and solid organ injuries and pelvic fractures. Those are the specific injuries in the abdomen you can get. And this, I think I have shown diaphragmatic injuries, they need to be repaired. Uh, if you see a diaphragmatic injury, you need to repair them, okay? And pancreatic injuries are very serious. So they happen usually due to blunt one. So pancreas can be uh, pancreas can be squash or crushed between the external force and the spine, right? Supposing the whatever the driver is crushed between the steering wheel and the whatever seat, and then you, what you can you can have compression, anterior posterior compression. So pancreas can be crushed between the external force and the spine so it can have transsectional pancreas and rural blowout and these are very serious injuries right uh, and bicycle handle no this is another important children then they uh, riding bicycle if they suddenly stop or, or hit something they can just throw on to the bicycle handle in their belly so then they can uh, crush their pancreas right i have seen one patient like this uh, and if you <coughs> encounter this one of for the difficult to manage sometime i think for undergraduate level you don't have to learn a lot about how to manage these pancreatic injuries uh, i think if you just know a little bit uh, it's enough okay Right, uh, kidney and GU injuries also can happen. So in this patient, you can see that the right kidney is torn and you can see contrast now going out of the kidney. So he has got um, renal hematoma plus uh, injury to uh, urinary pelvis. So that is those things. Are, okay, uh, so they can come with hematuria, low in pain <coughs> and bladder injuries. So some of these, uh, uh, Actually, some of these injuries can be managed conservatively, but some of them need surgeries, right? Right, this is bowel injury. Now, uh, they can be penetrating injury or even blunt, in, uh, blunt trauma. Can The bowel can rupture when there's when the anterior prostate compression. The bowel can rupture because there are, there's the eyes inside and when the eye compress, it can give away, right? Uh, sometimes it can be deceleration in like suppose somebody has fallen from height then the, the bubble can be torn fixed place from uh, mobile play. like in DJ flexure the, the door is fixed and small bubble is uh, mobile so at that place it can tear right DJ flexure can have tear and mesentric injury injuries also can happen they can bleed one thing and another thing is when the mesentric is torn that, that part of the bowel is going to die like in this picture so they can even present a little later because when the bowel is gangrene only they can present right after a few hours after a couple of hours or even a couple of days right the solid dog injuries are the one which can cause a lot of bleeding actually right liver and spleen and kidneys the common solid injury organ to injure in the abdomen is of the spleen <coughs> maybe about 50 percent of time solid injury in the injuries are due to splenic injury right and you also are not very uncommon so if now liver injury, if the patient is stable hemodynamically, you can manage them conservatively, right? Nowadays we have a CT scan to grade the injuries with the CT scan with the contrast and CT scan. And if patient is not bleeding actively and patient is stable, then of course you can just give them strict bed rest and if relevant, if necessary, give, give some blood then uh, or fluids and you can manage them conservatively. So, and patient, uh, if the patient is unstable, bleeding activity then of course you need to do laparotomy and do damage control right you pack the liver come out in other countries if they have support i mean they have uh, endovascular intervention if the patient is stable but still have a bleeder then you can do endovascular uh, in, uh, embolization and control that bleeder right so that is a possibility right spleen of course um, you can live without spleen so Generally, splenic injury you manage with surgery, right? You generally don't like to manage splenic injury conservatively nowadays. I mean, 
that's the principle. Rarely you can, um, once in a while you can manage, but normally if the spleen is damaged and it's bleeding, then of course better to do go and remove the spleen. Kidneys again, uh, some of the kidney injuries can be managed conservatively. If this bleeding has stopped, patient stable, then of course uh, do a CT scan and grade the injury and do a CT scan later on and, and uh, manage them conservatively. But if they if continue to bleed, patient is unstable or there is evidence of urine leak, then of course you have to remove that kidney, right? Right, so these are some of the indication to do emergency laboratory for a patient who is having trauma. If the patient is unstable, I told you again, he is bleeding inside, then of course you have to do damage control surgery, right? And if you see free air in the abdomen, in your x-ray, your free air that indicates bowel injury, you have to do laboratory. Definitely rupture, we told you, and there are signs of peritonitis that indicate bowel injury. Again, you need laboratory. And if, obviously, if you see bowel outside evisceration, then of course you need laparotomy. And penetration injury, impairment injury. Impairment means that the, whatever the offending weapon is still hanging. Uh, then of course, again, you need to laparotomy. If it is, if you think that that is breaching the peritoneum, right? If it is outside, of course, you don't have. And if you think that it's, it's going through and through, then of course, you need to laparotomy. Then only you can exclude internal bowel injury, right? Uh, so those are some of the indication and if it is sometimes fast and the EPL if it is positive which requires some surgery then of course you need to do a laparotomy. Sometimes some injuries can be managed as, as I said like liver injury if it is not bleeding you don't have to uh, do laparotomy even if it is if there's injury okay. I think that that I will um, kind of stop this uh, you now there are a lot of questions no. Can I? Uh, I don't. I yes, we move on to the questions. There was a request from the students as well to discuss these questions. Uh, uh -huh. How how long will you have? Uh, how can how how I select the question? Questions. I just, uh, question while you are doing, I just jotted jotted down some questions that they have asked. So uh, in uh -huh. triad, sir, uh -huh. the questions they have asked was: uh, if there's a child or an adult, who gets the priority? No, nobody is get priority. I told you, no, the priority gets priority depending on the ABCD requirement. If if somebody is need AI intervention, intervention that person requires first, first attention, right? Not the child, yeah. even pregnant mother, whatever it is, the first priority is given to the person who need AI protection first, right? If somebody is now supposing we have a patient who is having breathing problem and somebody is having circulation problem, suppose the child is having circulation problem, adult is having breathing problem again. Portion is having breathing problem need to be attended first, then the circulation person second, right? So that is you or you sort or you triage the patient according to A B C D requirement. Okay, not in, by anything else. Okay, did they answer that question? Uh, I think so, sir. And they have also have I think some people have mixed up that triage is a form of management because they have uh -huh. asked like whether best care can be given in triage or uh, triage uh, or now sometimes treatment. people uh, the triage word sometimes use for that place also for ED some people call that triage triage area okay. triage is is a French word it is for to sort right you sort okay. the people right? categorize so that is the meaning of triage triaging okay. for some, one person you don't have to try you know it's a, one patient so triaging you do for mass casualties. Now when you have a lot of people coming, a lot of patients coming and you don't have enough doctors and nurses and enough things to treat, right? Right. And okay. another yeah. question that arises was, uh, if the patient is bleeding, whether the airway comes first or the bleeder comes first? Yeah, if now that is ACC. No, now if it is outside, we supposing your carotid artery is gushing blood, then you put in your pressure there, it is, is to be done with A. That is a simple scene, the A, C scene, A is airway, C, one C is for cervical spine and another C is for external catastrophic yeah. bleeding. Not for liver bleeding, right? If somebody is having liver laceration and bleeding, then of course you need to attend the airway first and bleeding second and then bleeding, okay? If it is catastrophic bleeding outside, which you can put your finger and control, or you can put a ghost towel and control, only you can attend at A level, right? A, okay? Did I answer that question then? Yes, and I think what they should uh, 
keep in mind is that this kind of patients as we do like approach as a team isn't it sir like yeah, yeah, yes yes so right. there are different people managing airway breathing and circulation yeah so now that is one again important thing kaushik you have mentioned now now what i have discussed already is when you have only two people now one doctor one nurse and some supporting staff that is atls kind of when you don't have enough people but if you have hospitals having enough people then each group can attend to one like some the two people can attend to airway and one another people team can attend to breathing and another some other people can at the circulation at the same time that is done that is again when you are doing that sort of approach again there's one one person the team leader should follow the abcd protocol again right so he should now when when you have enough teams for airway one team breathing one team circulation one team and then for other one team then the person who is managing that patient is the team leader he in his mind he should follow the abcd again and he should instruct each team you do this one you do this that one you do that one okay if you have enough team to look after one person then each component you can attend at same time but the team leader team leader's mind again he should follow the abcd protocol okay did i answer that question uh, and the next question they had in airway was uh, what are the indications for cricothyroidectomy a uh, cricothyroidectomy that is again now if, now if you supposing you fail to intubate then i talk about this uh, one thing is you can put this laryngeal mask and other airways yeah, but if you if you really need if you suppose you can't get anything then of course to give a little bit of oxygen is next thing is to give cricothyroid puncture right uh doing tracheostomy in emergency is difficult that is what no within matter of 20 no i mean you, within matter of 2 minutes you can't do tracheostomy we need to get things ready and uh, sometimes you have to dis- dissect a little bit and the thyroid coming in the in the in middle and that you can't do within matter of 2 minutes right in that case to give a bit of oxygen you do a trich- tracheostomy puncture now of course <coughs> now if you that is one thing this puncture and give the oxygen that by doing that you can maintain the patient for a couple of minutes and then next thing is now that is not going to keep for long then you have to have good bigger yeah in that case you can do what you call cricothyroid tomy so what you do is you take a scalpel and make a hole cut here and open it up and put a tube there now of course now in there are this um, like cell tinga techniques you have cricothyroid tomy sets right you have a needle and put a guide wire there and then you dilate and dilate and put it so that sets also there so whatever it is nitrocotyroidotomy and cricothyroid puncture those things are done when there is a emergency when you can't get the in, uh, tubes in when the patient is dying basically right dying with suffocation then that is what that is in that are, those are indication those, that is indication to do tricothyroid puncture and cricothyroidotomy okay by doing the thyroid tomy you can put a bigger tube like small um, tracheostomy tube you can put so that be good enough to ventilate okay yes. and also they had a question on uh, when to do the cervical spine x-rays yeah that is during your uh, now if you are reading the old now when you were student about how many years ago i don't know about 20 15 years ago uh, this during your primary survey i talk about this adjuncts like your et tube oxygen and Um, ECG and um, blood gas analysis and things like that and chest x-ray AP and pelvic x-ray you know? and uh, in our time they talk about lateral shoot through x-ray that is to exclude cervical spine injury but now you, you know that doing uh, neck x-ray you can't exclude cervical spine injury you know? understand so if you are doing a sm- if you are in a small hospital where there is no CT scan you know, then of course doing that is no harm So if you come across old MCQ, sometimes in that they talk about this uh, lateral in a section and open mouth view and things like that in your primary survey. Still no harm doing, but uh, if no you don't. Now I told you that you don't have to exclude spine injury during your primary survey. Okay, there is no no need of exclusion. What you need to do is you have to pre- protect the spine during your primary survey and secondary survey, and then when patient is stable enough. you can leisurely take the patient to ct scan or whatever and do a full spine next scan whatever and make sure there are no fractures so if there are fractures you can characterize them okay understand did i answer that question or oh, i did i make it more complicated now 
no i think you are clear sir because what is important is to protect the spine protect and the spine is the way and then with a uh, x ray uh, with the x ray of course you can't detect certain cervical spine injury so best thing mm-hmm. is to protect the spine manage the life threatening injuries and then once the patient is stable we can go ahead with a ct scan it is clear later on yeah yes. yeah enough time you don't have to do it today you can do it even for tomorrow right no harm because nobody is going to fix a spine at the same time right now when the patient is somebody's le- bleeding from his liver you are nobody is going to fix his spine right when the patient is stable when they are think ready uh, when the patient can put the patient prone no, only only you can put the, do the spine fac- fixation we are not going to do that anyway right so until such time we just protect the spine you look to the patient and put the collar and that's all okay another question they had was sir what are the specific type of cervical collars you can use uh the ideal thing is uh, philadelphia collar is one yeah and uh, I, no that is not good enough i mean if you are, that, that is good enough just to keep the patient in the bed but if you want to transport the patient you need to have like, head locks and strapping and things like that the picture i showed you actually these are things are now available in our hospital also the spinal board and straps and head blocks and those are the things right Any yes uh, there was some questions from uh, breathing part as well mm-hmm. uh, they have again asked uh, when there is a tension pneumothorax what comes first whether it's the airway or the breathing so uh, the golden yeah. rule i think is as you said earlier it is yeah, yeah, just yeah, the yeah. airway breathing yeah. because airway will kill you first yeah. then the yeah. problems in the breathing isn't it yeah. so they have made that a b c d order because in the way of uh, uh, I mean, they have given the priority in the way that which can kill you first. Yeah, that's very correct, Kaushik. Yes. Uh, then they have asked uh, for in uh, uh, before GA, do we have to release the uh, pneumothorax? I think. Uh, yes, you need. Yes, you need. You need, you need. Yes. You are, if some sim- simple pneumothorax can become tension when you are intubating and ventilating. because when you are normally breathing you are your chest is negative pressure no? when you are yes. doing positive pressure you build up pressure inside chest cavity and you end up with simple pneumothorax become tension so if you diagnose simple pneumothorax or then you have to put a tube on then tube and then only you intubate the patient then only you uh, paralyze the patient and give positive pressure ventilation okay and there was another question with the flail chest and open pneumothorax respond well to uh, ventilation I think you answered the question on yeah. your yeah. yeah open your thorax of course you need to close that wound no? that is yes. if, if, the, if the injury is just a chest wall then of course you don't need to do anything i mean you just close that and put a ice tube that's it i think that's it yes uh, flail chest also you might be able to get away with yeah. but sometimes there can be underlying uh, lung contusions no, that is a, that is a serious problem now usually flail chest itself will not kill the patient that lung contusion is a serious problem so lung is damaged no? then yeah exchange won't happen and other thing is most important is flail chest is pain relief right uh, yes. you might have to put epidural line and give very good pain relief that is the important if you are if you are elected elected to ventilate the patient and then of course you can give intravenous kind of pain relief but if your patient is having small uh, flail segment and he can be managed without ventilating then of course the import, most important thing is to give some very good pain relief right ideal thing would be epidural uh, analgesia or nerve block for something like that okay so patient control anesthesia and they had also asked about uh, whether finger decompression should be done prior to needle decompression in a tension pneumothorax finger de- uh, what is it i think what they must be meaning is like uh, when you in, we make a <laughs> incision in the thorax and then we put the finger and before uh-huh. i get in the ic tube we do decompress it with the finger but i think if you yeah. in tension pneumothorax first thing is if you don't have if you can't put in ic tube quickly the best thing is to put the in needle. the needle needle yes okay, you can around. when you are insert in the ic tube you can put your finger and decompress it anyway you are, you are doing that no? when you are doing a yes. ic tube and uh, few questions from the circulation part sir they have asked uh, uh, can there be bradycardia in class 4 shock Yeah, when you are going to die. <laughs> yes, yes I think it's the pre-terminal <laughs> event. So yes, before yeah. arresting, you can get bloody cardiac. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they have also asked about uh, damage control resuscitation. I think that part you addressed in your lecture, sir. 
and uh, again they have asked about uh, whether spring injuries can be managed conservatively yeah we have managed about last during last eight month we have managed about three patients but i think for your purpose um that is very tricky you know if you have very good support we have very good we have ct scan we have very good support all the time and our hospital there are consultant on call all the time there are sr and anybody who can do a laparotomy at any given time you know? so if you have that much of good support then of course if patient is stable and a small injury young patient fit then of course you can manage but general teaching is it's better to get rid of the spleen right yeah. they, that's what we that's now normal teaching you know you can live without spleen without any problem so that is why you are taking a unnecessary risk now liver is for, of course you can't live without liver we have to save liver okay <laughs> And they have asked in class one hemorrhage can it be managed without fluids? Yeah, you, you yes, yes, turn fifty should be able to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But you have to be very yeah, sure yeah. that it's a class one hemorrhage. Yeah, yeah, that is one thing. Another little bit inhuman. No, if you are lost something, yes. better to give some a little bit fluid. No, otherwise you you they feel bit of the. You can manage. They won't die definitely. If a young yes. person, they won't die unless there is some underlying organ problem. Young and fit person easily can um, I mean, get away, but it is not nice. No, if you have diagnosed that he has lost some, then we should give some fluids and get the things sorted. No. And they have asked, what is the choice of fluids in? Uh, um, what is the uh, what is the choice of fluid in uh, resuscitation in the initial crystalloid bolus? What is it? Heart man or normal saline? Both are equal. No, there is not no much of a difference now. Um, you, whatever the things you have available, there is no much of a difference. The Hartman is more physiological now. If you look at the electrolyte uh, combination, there is more, more, more closer to uh, blood now. Um, the plasma, that is what. No, otherwise, there is no much of a difference. And they have also asked whether we can do a uh, contrast in and CT in non-responders or transient responders. Contrast CT is not for transient or non-responders. Yes. We have, if you are going for CT scan, he has to be stable. How are you going to yes. patient for CT scan when patient is having blood pressure of 60? He is die, he is going to die on the table, CT scan table, right? So we are not going to do any CT scan for somebody who is, in, who is unstable, not, not for transient or unstable person, right? If patient is unstable, you need to take the patient theater and cut him open and then pack and do whatever and get the bleeder stop, right? Yeah. So we are not going to take any person to anywhere unless the theatre when patient is unstable. Okay, and that's the take home message. You never do a CT in unstable, unstable. patient. Patient, yes. Um, not, not only CT, even X-ray, right? X-ray, yes, you shouldn't, <laughs> you shouldn't send the patient to radiography department at all. <laughs> and even if a polytrauma patient after stabilizing, if you are sending, you should uh, accompany the patient. Accompany, 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 yeah, accompany. Yeah, need, need, they can deteriorate yeah. at any moment. And they have asked with the DPL or the ultrasound is best in evaluation of the, it's obviously the ultrasound because DPL oh, is now not really done now. I, I told you the indication very rarely now we do our DPL now. Uh, they have also asked with the cardiac tamponade and tension pneumothorax can lead to reduced consciousness. We are going to die, no? <laughs> yes, that you die, you lose consciousness. <laughs> Those things can invariably lead to hypoxia and hypotension and yeah, yeah, hypoxia yeah. and hypotension can lead to reduced level of consciousness. <laughs> they are going to die. Yeah. Uh, since uh, we have been asked about uh, uh, there was a question regarding uh, uh, whether whether we do the bulbocavernous reflex in primary survey. I don't think that you, yes. you are not going yeah, you are not going to do those things in I mean that is the secondary survey, that is detailed yes. examination is secondary survey, right? Yes. You are not going to do uh, those spi I mean spinal fractures. Uh, we are not going to treat during primary survey anyway. That's for secondary survey, secondary survey and subsequent management. Okay. So that is not it. You have to be very simple you know, during your primary survey just to save somebody's life, you know, get the physiology back. That is what, okay. There was another question. This question was not that clear. In spi cervical spine injury, is it possible to cause spinal shock always 
and upper or lower motor neuron lesions depending on the level of transaction. Um, so if somebody is having cervical spine injury, they can get neurogenic shock. Don't confuse spinal shock and neurogenic shock. Right? Yes, that's the point <laughs> I want to highlight. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Neurogenic spinal shock, shock and neurogenic yeah. shock are two yeah. things. Yes. Two, two things, no? So what we are, the, now what we are, Shock, no? When the sympathetic drive is gone, then uh, you get uh, mesodilatation and you get bradycardia and then uh, hypotension. That is what we are worried here. So new, this spinal shock is something, neurology, no? yes, you ask for neurologist. <laughs> it is uh, because what of we are worried is uh, neuro neurogenic shock because the loss of mesomotor and mesodilatation lead to hypotension and also the bradycardia that can occur. But spinal shock mm -hmm. is, I think, uh, all the spinal yeah. reflexes yeah. below that uh, level yeah. of transit will be not present and, uh, until yeah. some time. So that is spinal shock. So that has nothing to do with uh, hemodynamics. Yeah, that is neurology basically, no? Yes. And there was another question. Why do we do the log roll in uh, primary CV? Because in, log, uh, in primary CV, we are uh, worried only about life-threatening injuries. So what's the point of doing a log roll? So if you now if you look at that picture with the open pneumothorax, you saw that at the back. How do you know that the part is in the back? So if there's a big stab injury to your chest, uh, then how do you know that there's injury uh, which is can be life threatening and injury to stab injury to kidney? We don't know. The half the thing is at like the back, no? So that's why you need to log roll and check. So there can be a stab injury to spine here, or it could be anything no, in the back, which we don't know. So that's why you have to log roll and see what's happening at the back. Yes. And also uh, you have to identify uh, spinal injuries also can be. Yeah, that's a, yeah you can see sp the spine the and doing your corrective examination. Everything can be done when you are log roll the patient. No? There were some other questions also like some indications for exploratory laboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, liver acerations, is it always an indication? No, no, told, no, no. if patient is stable, liver laceration, a lot of patients nowadays with the CT scan, sometimes by the time they reach the hospital, they, the bleeding has already stopped. Yes, there is laceration and he has bled and the bleeding has stopped. So patient is stable, when you give a little bit of fluid and blood, then patient has become stable. Then of course, with the CT scan, if a CT scan not showing active leak, active bleeding, then of course you can manage them consecutively. Don't open. And they have also asked whether small bowel injuries can be managed conservatively. No, not in this world. <laughs> Any small bowel injuries can be you have to open, right? There are no way of managing bowel injuries conservatively, right? The patient is going to get generalized peritonitis and die. And also there's a question, when, when are we going to examine the joints? So that comes in the secondary. secondary so so the, that's a detail exam, so head to toe, for everything you have. Examine when the patient is stable hemodynamically, then you have a time. No, you can especially you can check head to toe. There was another question with the pancreatic pseudocyst can occur following trauma. Yeah, when they can have a pancreatitis and after a couple of weeks they can have anything. No, so that is why it all where pancreatic injuries are not simple. Now, I think your level they won't ask a lot of questions about it. It's a very difficult condition. I mean, they think to them I mean, manage right. Pancreas, I mean, one thing is the, the bleeding, and the other thing is when pancreas damage, the can, pancreas can autolyze, you know, start pancreatitis, and that is very dangerous. And when it's associated with oral injuries, it's a mess, no? It's very difficult to manage. So, the, a lot of people actually die. Uh, I mean, we can't do much, of course. And then when they develop pancreatitis and whatever, they can easily get uh, pseudocyst or whatever. All the complications of pancreatitis they can get. That's another question, sir. If an already cannulated conscious patient is brought with bleeding, is the first thing to do is check the cannula or airway assessment. As we said, again, airway. So that, that, will, that won't take a second even run time, right? Yes. You need to go through this protocol. So that is not to miss. Now, we must have seen now in, in, in this, uh, that is good example is even in the films, they must, you must have seen this, the pilots, when they do this thing, even though you know that the aircraft is very good condition, they have to go through the protocol. Then only they can start the engine and that's how, even though they 100% sure they, they just flow the flow on the aircraft, still they have to go through the protocol. Otherwise they will make a silly mistake, right? So that don't let us to make the silly mistake, okay? We can obviously, by just by looking at the patient, we can think that he's okay, but 
again talk to patient if patient talking that means that your ear is fine so then you okay right and the as you correctly said earlier even if we even when we are doing circulation part if there's a drop in saturation or something we have to again do that drill go back to a b c yeah. yes uh, and uh, basically uh, those are the uh, questions that uh, are sir if mm -hmm. anybody else have any questions they can yeah. unmute their mics and uh, ask uh, do you all have any other questions i think how should we can uh, uh, call it now is it 15 yeah yes 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 uh, so that's it in the absence of questions uh, we will uh, conclude the today's session so i would like to thank dr jeevanth ratnayaka for uh, conducting this uh, lecture on uh, management of trauma and also i would like to thank uh, the trc for uh, providing us the technical support and also the professor professor kudagamman for organizing this whole series of uh, lectures thank you very much sir. thank you very much thank you, thank you very much thank you professor tusharos